bit of a chairman's prerogative. In the audience is David Eiton, who's the global head of research and technology at BP. And David led a task force that the CIAG stroke NCUB ran on, on how you extract and grow value from the research space. And David, I just wanted to, it took us 18 months to do this. Let's give you a chance to respond. Um, thank you, Chairman, for your authority. Uh, Minister uh, Fanny, thank you. Um, I, I mean, I'm just reflecting on the work we led uh, on the task force. Um, and there are many resonances with your work. And you've obviously taken it a lot further. Um, the, the most obvious resonances are around um, growing funding, the relationship between universities and businesses, promoting entrepreneur, entrepreneurism, and then we focused a lot on differentiating between sectors because we don't think innovation in construction is the same as innovation in pharma and that a, a sectoral approach is required and that's very much being picked up, I know, uh, by the minister and by the industrial strategies. Um, but we nevertheless, I think, resonated strongly with your notion of stickiness, which you've mentioned, and I think we use the same word in our conversations. Um, what, what I would say, though, is that we're all inclined to say we need to do more. Um, and I know that you're not saying that the word impediment is used in one of your recommendations. I've read the summary, I'm afraid I haven't read the, um, the whole document yet. Um, and we struggle with uh, what not to do or what to do less of, uh, as opposed to what to do. And if I abstract into uh, the European context, I've been sitting on a, a high-level group looking at innovation in Europe, and I have to say it's much more a theme there about there's just too much stuff, and we need to get that out the way in order to provide some space for innovation. I just wondered whether in your excellent piece of work, which I look forward to reading the rest of, um, you had any conversations about what we have too much of or what we really t should not do or should stop doing in order to try and create spaces in addition to doing the more and funding more that obviously we all support. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, thanks very much for the comments and the question. I, I think there were areas where we could do less. It's not that we should necessarily completely stop or cease a particular activity, but we have I think on a number of dimensions, too much fragmentation around a desired activity. And actually funding is quite a good example of that. So we, w I think there's a view that we should invest more to try and, I mean, the way, the way I view universities and translation of uh, applied economic output, obviously you need a research activity, you then need to find a way to translate it. Those two things are critical. It's not or, it's and. And I think it would be very short-sighted to pay for one by reducing the other. Um, but they are, in the scheme of things, if, against all other expenditure of government, tiny droplets in the ocean, which are then critical pump primers for huge potentially economic activity, if we could get them to stick in the UK. You know, obviously, there's not much point spending money there if we're just going to export it somewhere else, but if we're going to be able to keep it. What struck me within the funding arena is just how complex and fragmented it is. We can, and I've seen it, uh, I had another role uh, to... Um, review the Research <coughs> Council um, review process. I can't remember what the phrase was. There was some kind of final oversight audit of that review. There was data in that review that showed that scientists in Britain's universities spend up to 25% of their time writing grant applications. It's insane. And you can, uh, there is an argument to say that having to source money from more than one location increases the peer review and therefore helps contribute to excellence. And I buy that. But the idea that one in every four hours of a scientist's time is spent writing grants for the next thing, which in some cases takes 12, up to 12 months before you know what you're going to get, just doesn't feel right. So there's just seemed to me that there are areas like funding where fragmentation has got um, it's too far, and there ought to be some thoughtfulness. One of the reasons why I like the Arrow Project notion, because it's at least a mechanism to try and bring some consolidation to decision making and to try and to... Not, not to make it easy, but to not make it an endurance marathon either. And it, you know, it's trying to find that some sensible balance which we need to try and do. The second area, which again, some progress being made, but I think we are a little bit, we are still a little bit in a thousand flowers bloom policy world uh, when you look at, for example, LEPs. And, you know, with all respect to the people who've been given the jobs to look after LEPs and the, right, and the, and, and the rest, there's a lot of wheels being spun to try and make things happen, which probably are never going to happen, because fundamentally 
that part of the world isn't the competitive advantage place to do that work. What you then see is things like UKTI being encouraged to support all of those agendas because those agendas are important to be supported, when in fact UKTI should probably be focused on five or six technologies in five or six places to try and make an impact internationally. So you end up with that fragmentation kind of confuses and complicates and simply dilutes what are relatively scarce, albeit high value resources in the system. So for me, it wasn't so much identifying a thing we could stop. It was more about, can we make calls more quickly? Can we give scarce resource owners like UKTI, so scarce high value resource owners like UKTI, can we give them better role clarity and direction? And can we take some fragmentation out of some of the processes to try and find a slightly better equilibrium than, than we apparently found today? So that was more where I saw the scope of um, efficiency to be brought back into the system. Well, just to describe what the fragmentation is, um, I mean, there is a lot of, I mean, the university is very heavily dependent on European funding, um, and it's, you know, one of the things we actually have a net benefit from the European Union in is research, and we've been keen to maintain that. So, but it does provide its own separate sets of criteria and discipline. Uh, for the academics, the most important are the research councils. And you know they have their own peer review criteria and the academics approving academic work, and we don't want to interfere with that. I think where we have become more systematic is in um, getting behind the technology strategy board. I mean, it would have been so easy for a new government to say, "Oh, this is some quango invented by our predecessors. Let's get rid of it or rename it or whatever." But we took the view this was a very, very good organisation, and we are now channeling more resources through it. Uh, and I think there is more coherence, therefore, in the innovation space. And as Andrew said, potentially there will be the local enterprise partnerships. But I don't think they will be doing a great deal around kind of innovation issues. They'll be more involved in training and infrastructure, things of that kind. Now, how is it being made coherent? Well, what I like to think is that in the industrial strategy work that we're doing, uh, which is essentially government business collaboration, long-term thinking, getting beyond one parliament, we are identifying for some core sectors like aerospace, cars, biosciences, um, uh, you know, op offshore renewables, oil and gas and so on. We're identifying what their priorities are and what's the best way of funding them and what's the best way of supporting research and innovation and maintaining some coherence in that way. Terrific. <clears throat> It'd be good to hear from uh, Leps just before I bring you in a second. I think Peter Jones is in the audience, who's chair of the South East. Uh, Peter, it'd be good to get your perspective on it. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, in our lab, uh, which covers about 4 million people, uh, covering Essex, Kent, and East Sussex, um, our universities and colleges are going to be at the heart of everything we're trying to do over the next um, seven or eight years to the end of this decade. And so for us, there are three priorities, really is to help um, the private sector and uh, local authorities build about 100,000 houses. Uh, we then have to invest in um, transport infrastructure, which has been neglected for decades. But most important, we want to drive growth. Uh, and we want to drive it in partnership with our universities and colleges. And one of the mechanisms which we're looking to is the EU Jessica program, uh, back, uh, with uh, not only EU grants, but uh, substantial borrowings from the European Investment Bank. And you know, we've got nine universities in our area, some very good ones on our borders in uh, fellow LEPs. And we want to try and create three things with our universities. Much um, uh, improved um, knowledge transfer and uh, business skill transfer from business schools and departments and technical departments. But also to build a very large business parks on all of the campuses where new businesses can uh, develop and local SMEs uh, can be supported. And the final thing I want to try and do is something I first saw at um, Washington State University, is spin out businesses from the intellectual property uh, that is developed in all of our universities and create a mechanism to um, uh, try and develop that in a coherent way, uh, bringing in, obviously, venture capitalists and banks to fund uh, the various stages of that development. But, I promise you the, uh, the nine vice-chancellors 
uh, from our area are my key partners in everything that we'll be doing in the next uh, uh, decade. Terrific. Now I can see some questions coming out. One at the back there, two at the back. Good man, right, remember to say who you are and where you're from. Um, uh, Anne Lim, I'm the chair of the South East Midlands uh, LEP, uh, which actually is based in Cranfield University, uh, so there's a good link there. Um, my question just builds on what the Secretary of State said um, about, and indeed what my fellow chair from the um, South East LEP has said about the really important links in terms of local growth with further education colleges. And although uh, your review uh, rightly focuses on growth <coughs> in universities, given that so many FE colleges also do HE work, I just wonder about the need to try and extend the national view to taking an overview of FE and local growth. Thank you. Let's take that second question as well. Hi. Uh, my name is Brian Condon from the Centre for Creative Collaboration, which is a University of London project. About half our work is with SMEs. Uh, and we're also a partner in the London Fusion Project that David mentioned in his introduction. Uh, my question, Sandra, is in two parts. Uh, about the Arrow projects in particular, which seem to me to be um, a new idea uh, amongst a, you know, quite a crowded space. And um, how will the Arrows hit the right target markets and not just be whizzy technology looking for, you know, a, for a sale? Uh, the second part of that question is, how do you see um, SMEs benefiting and being included in these ARA projects as collaborators rather than kind of useful slaves, which is their normal role in these kinds of projects? Wow. Yeah, no, interesting. Um, so, and I think, I mean, to give you the, the very precise answer to the question, the, the brief of the review was universities, and, and one thing I've learned is trying to avoid scope creep is quite a difficult thing to do. So when, when people give you the title of review, you kind of grab onto it as the best way to prevent scope creep, uh, which is bluntly why we didn't go there, so just totally frankly. I think it's clear, though, that just as there are, just as you can, and we tried to make the argument that obviously there is diversity of type of university, and different universities have different roles to play within the system. Um, clearly, FE colleges are, in my view, a continuation of that, of that continuum, right? And therefore, you, I don't think it would be a massive leap of the imagination to think about how that could be brought together. But bluntly, we use the definition of the review to prevent the ever, you know, potential never finishing problem. Um, Brian, in terms of the uh, Arrow projects, so, the, and I, I, you know, obviously an independent review isn't supposed to make life easy for politicians, and this doesn't make life, you know, and I apologize to Vince because it, it does force some difficult questions, which are easier to answer if you're in the private sector than if you're in a political world. You, you, we know that. I think there is, a no, I, I think <laughs> there is a, a gap, actually, and, 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 this space has got a lot more impressive in Britain in the last two years than it has been for the last 40 years, because for the first time in 40 years, we've got an industrial strategy, which I think, you know, whatever you believe the rights and wrongs of that are, at least there is a framework which is starting to allow government and everybody else to coalesce around a focus point. We have the catapults, which, as Secretary of State described, give you a kind of a physical anchor location to start to think about how to bring together activity. Where I still think we are missing a bit, and it speaks a little bit to David Willett's eight great technologies, we haven't really got to the point of saying, well, okay, really, 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 where are the factories of the next 20 years? What are they going to be making 20 years from now? Where are we going to put our bets? Now, the reason it gets difficult, I think, for people like Secretary of State and others is because you're getting dangerously close to picking the winners, right? And it's so tempting, I think, to stand back from that. And you can either end up with nothing in the space, or you can end up with, which is where we've been for a very long time, and, I, and I've paid great credit to, to Vince and Viz for leading the industrial strategy, because I think it was absolutely time overdue to start to bring some degree of focus. I think there is, when you look across the technology platforms of the UK, I think there is the beginnings of scope for us to say there is a degree of higher specificity that we could, with reasonable levels of confidence, but also with the knowledge that we may get it wrong, 
the reasonable levels of confidence that we could lean forward into aligning our energies around some technology platforms, which, of course, by definition, are likely to use catapults as one of the vehicles to drive them forward, but which actually raise the priority and just give a degree of specificity so that we start to look toward, okay, we said we were going to do something on graphene. What have we done on graphene? Not what have the Koreans done with graphene. What have we done with graphene? And how many jobs have we... And it's that... I picked that, it's probably a terrible example, but it's an example that everybody's aware of and knows in their minds. That's really where I'm trying to get the, where I think there is an opportunity, but I completely accept it isn't an easy political choice, which is why I think it needs thoughtfulness and it needs you know, proper sen uh, sense of review and understanding all of those things. But I, do, I just think there is a, there's a little bit of a gap there where if we're not careful, we could kind of say, well, we've got an industrial strategy. We could say we've got a place where people are getting together doing stuff, but we still might not get that industry developed for the UK. And it's that that I think we need to just tr see whether or not we've got the capability to lean forward into that space. So, you know, that was... Sorry, the second part of your question was SMEs. Listen, the, the, the SME, and, and um, Martin will tell you, from the very first day I walked through the doors of this building, the first thing I asked Martin was the number one thing I think this department should be fixated on, is how do you get an SME to hire one more person? It's the backbone of the bridge. So I would never endorse a view which said SMEs are somehow a, you know, oil in the machine or, or whatever. They are absolutely pivotal, which is why I wanted to bring out in this report Two things, really. One is the potential role of universities to be huge, I think, points of leverage for SMEs. Imagine you're that small, startup, mid-sized company. Why aren't you exporting? And one of the things we're hearing more, I hear, in this review is we don't have the confidence to export. Why don't you have the confidence? How do we give you the confidence? Well, the business school is a potential vehicle for that. To be honest, if I was, I used to work for a company with 25 people in it. I wouldn't have gone online to get advice to export, and if I did, it wouldn't have transformed my view of the world. Going to sit with somebody in a business school, having the chance to work it out properly, maybe that would have transformed my view of the world. Those, that, I think, is one place to go. Really giving those small companies global leverage through business, global insight, global capability through business school, I think it's tremendously exciting. Some brilliant examples of that being done at the moment, place like Aston, Great, great example, but not everywhere. Great example of what's going on. Secondly, the reason I call the projects arrows rather than pinpricks or anything else was to try and get the, the notion that it was literally an arrowhead. Of course, there has to be a breakthrough technology at the front end, but the bulk of what makes that arrowhead have impact is everything that sits underneath that breakthrough idea, the supply chain. And that has to be SMEs. Chances are that is not coming from a research-based university. It's probably coming from FEs. It's probably coming from newer universities. And that, for me, is where there was a great opportunity to really show the kind of transformative value that SMEs and all sorts of learning institutions can have in the mix. And so I hope that does come through, but that was certainly the intent. Just a word about two issues. One is the importance of the FE sector, which you emphasised. I mean, what's happening is that the boundaries between universities and FE colleges are being blurred, and, and that is right. Um, there's no justification for having some arbitrary dividing line. And quite a few of the universities now have little federations of, I mean, I know Middlesbrough does and Hertfordshire, where I was earlier this week, they have a federation of local FE colleges that do um, degree level courses and cooperate with them in all kinds of ways. And that's a great model and we should be encouraging it. Um, I mean, the FE colleges are also important because they're at the heart of the training pro the issue, which is where we're, we're really struggling as a country. I mean, the massive gaps in skilled labor from engineering graduates uh, through um, all kind of crafts that we're, we're desperately short of. I won't go into the whole story here, but F FE colleges, of course, are key delivery organizations, uh, and the, the LEPs will have an important role in, in all of that. Can I just say a little bit? I, 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 I get a bit confused as to how we sort out the arrows from the catapults and all the rest of it. I mean, the way, the way I, uh, uh, I mean, what I'm trying to, trying to think of is how you get from industrial strategy, which we do have, built around core disciplines and 
core sectors. How you get down from that to work uh, by researchers and technologists? I mean, what's the link? And, and in some cases, in most cases, we're starting from the industry and work, at, work back. And a good example of this is the work that's happening in the aerospace sector. We've got an agreement with the aerospace. We're putting a billion pound into the aerospace industry over the next seven to ten years. It's a massive commitment, given that we're short of money. Uh, industry is doing the same. And with that, we'll generate all kind of work on materials and different aspects of different technologies, uh, which will ensure that we still have an aerospace industry in ten years' time. It's not the foregone conclusion, that we, but we have to make sure that happens. Similarly, with the car industry, uh, we've agreed with the car industry we're going to invest in a new generation of propulsion systems and the government's putting in a lot of money, they're putting in a lot of money, companies like Jaguar Land Rover leading the way. And so it's industry-led and they define the problem and they define the technologies that they need to pull through and Agritech is the other one in, in that group. But the other approach to this, which may be closer to what Andrew means by arrows, is, is to start with the technology and build on it. And the graphene is the model we've got at the moment. And there may be others. The, the, the buzz word at the moment is quantum technologies. Well, I don't fully understand what it means in terms of physics, but uh, I, I, I do understand there is a cluster of institutions in British universities that are doing some very, very advanced work, which I think is two years ahead of anywhere else in the world, and a belief that this has potentially enormous economic implications if we can harness it. So th there is that the other way of doing it, therefore, which is to identify these technologies and then work back and, and build up an infrastructure in support of it. I think the one final thing I'll say about that, it is always dangerous when politicians start picking technologies because they sound great and they've met a couple of scientists who are very eloquent. I mean, we have to, be, we have to, we have to, have, a, we have to have a methodology for judging these things on their professional merits. So I, just, I, so, so I think um, we have exactly the same view of where this gap is. And, I, and um, without naming the technology, one of the one of the things that really struck me during the review with with a couple of the universities who are hosting one of these potential breakthrough technologies, which isn't yet un, involved in lots of uh, uh, things, was a very 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 strong sense that large companies are not the best ones to embrace breakthrough technology because they see themselves being disintermediated by that technology. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a really strong argument to say, of course, we should work with. I mean, you know. Vince knows that companies like GSK love to see the government being involved in helping support the bioscience sector, just as Jaguar Land Rover would the automotive se sector. But I think we, the country needs to hedge its bet that there could be technologies which are invented which are actually perceived at least initially as threats by big companies. They aren't naturally going to embrace them, and, but Britain shouldn't ignore them either. And that's where I think there's a complementary dynamic around doing the things like the industrial strategy industry-led approach, and also having the technology-led approach, with graphing been an interesting example, but I think it's really, uh, I think it really would be uh, a very positive for the country if we can do both. And now obviously that's all about funding and capacity and everything else, but they do seem to me there is a risk of uh, just making sure that we stay on the cutting edge of things which actually the incumbents may not immediately welcome, which mm -hmm. is a phenomenon in big companies. I'm pretty sure that the Roman army used catapults to, fu uh, used, um, catapults to fire arrows, so there is a kind of yeah. metaphor that <laughs> works here. Uh, I think we could squeeze in three or four quickies, so down the front and then two and then at the back. We take um, them all and then they can, the guys can respond. Uh, I'm Tim Jones, I chair the Heart of the Southwest Local Enterprise Partnership, um, which is Devon and Somerset. Um, uh, it's the funding question, I'm afraid, probably for uh, Secretary of State, uh, I, I guess. Um, the, the, we greatly welcome the report, but the bit where we feel perhaps the, the past has been passed to the LEP um, is how do we fund uh, the, de de the delivery platforms. And uh, you suggest that the government should create some new funding streams. Uh, the Secretary of State's already said there are expensive implications. Um, now, um, how do we do this um, is, is the rhetorical question I guess uh, all the LEP chairs are going to have to be wrestling with. Um, and is this not really the moment where we need to wrestle with that problem? Um, maybe it's part of uh, Secretary of State's uh, new business bank. Maybe this is 
a role for the government guarantee. Maybe this is uh, a role to look at um, the European models, German model, uh, Japanese model, American model, municipal bonds, those sort of areas. But uh, my question <coughs> is, do we need to address the issue of a new funding structure if we're going to avoid uh, having uh, a problem with the LEPs uh, and uh, to relieve the pressure of having to bid for more <coughs> funding, which uh, we know how debilitating debilitating that process is. Brilliant. Could you pass the mic back? Could everyone keep them short and sweet because we've got a two o'clock kickoff. Um, <coughs> Steve Rothberg from Loughborough University. Uh, just a couple of quick points. Um, the, the review says a lot of interesting things about LEPs and about innovation. And I wondered, Sir Andrew, if you had the chance that you might try to get the word innovation into the name of LEPs to consolidate that idea. Sorry, I coughed in his ear. You might have to repeat that. <laughs> I think um, I got it. The, the review says a lot of interesting things about the LEPs and about innovation, and I wondered if, given the chance, you might like to get the word innovation into the title of the LEPs to consolidate that idea. My second quick point is that in the recent past, universities have been given an awful lot of encouragement to protect their intellectual property and to generate an income stream directly back to the university from it. I wonder whether your review is saying that that's not the right priority, that the right priority is to use that intellectual property to be out in the economy and creating jobs. Terrific. And next, you get the mic across to the guy next to you. John Francis from the University of South Wales. Um, in terms of engaging with SMEs, it, our experience, I think, is that if you have a specific project around a particular area, you can get engagement. But in terms of the demand, the general demand, there isn't, you know, there isn't a huge demand. Is there something that we should be doing in terms of trying to encourage broader demand rather than round specific project areas. Yeah. Terrific. And last question in the back. I am Sarah Main from the Campaign for Science and Engineering. I just wondered if the panel could comment on um, how they feel they can reconcile two apparently seeming uh, different trajectories. One is uh, the past trend towards research funding of universities going towards funding of excellence, which tends to concentrate funding into uh, you know, the Golden Triangle Universities of England and Scotland. Um, and that necessarily means there isn't, uh, there's a limited pot of money, so universities in other areas don't necessarily have so much money and have, in some cases have had to close departments. So I just wonder if the panel could comment on how you can ensure that those regional universities, for want of a better word, retain enough strength to support the ambition to, for them to develop economic strength. Okay. Terrific, Andrew. Okay, uh, I'll leave Tim's question to Secretary of State um, in terms of the funding piece. Uh, I def I mean, obviously, I think the LEPs should be really enormously influenced by the innovation agenda. I I I'm not sure about the name of I'm not sure. I was trying to think about what it might look like, but it probably wouldn't be great. Um, <laughs> the <laughs> like, um, like, but, but um, you know, having a much more overt. Uh, role of universities within the LEP decision making and really having some greater focus on um, measures and uh, deliverability of that innovation agenda I think would be a great signal for government to send to LEPs and, and I do think you, more could be done there. Uh, as far as demand for SME support, I can't, obviously if there's a specific project that people are going to look for that support. I'm just struck. I think there's a great opportunity for us to talk about general business. So, I mean, SME could be two people, it could be 100 people, it could be 500 people. It could have a project, it could, might not have a project. All these businesses are capable of growing if they were better at business, Wh whatever that means. It might be an invention, it might be export confidence, it might be whatever it is. And it just seems to me that we have this, we've gone in this slightly odd place in the world where we either offer it through a website or we kind of don't offer it. And uh, I think there is a tremendous network of capabilities sat across the country embedded in universities, which you know, literally you can go no more than 15 miles from your office and you can sit down and you can start to get advice. And I think we should really be trying to find a way to open up the offer. I do think this is one of those things where you probably have to create the offer first before you stimulate the demand because I think their initial reaction is going to be, really? What's in, you know, really? And I think we have to put ourselves in the position of an SME uh, manager who hasn't got time to breathe. So why on earth are they going to spend time trying to unravel a complicated access strategy to an institution? I think we have to make it easy. And I think it's such a great opportunity to, to, to 
enhance the value and the human face-to-face -face contact of the consultancy support that you could extract from the, univers from the business schools. So that's where I would focus. Um, funding for excellence, um, you know, I was absolutely impressed by the, an awful lot of the most exciting technologies in the UK are not in the elite universities. And however that's happened, maybe, maybe necessity is the mother of invention, I don't know what it is, but you, know, you go to places which have not been historically uh, prioritized within the research excellence, and yet they are producing some extraordinary stuff. So first of all, we've all we, we retain a, I think, geographically uh, diverse set of centers for breakthroughs. I was struck by the enhanced applied view of many of the regional universities, to use your phrase. I think there is a great emphasis on application. I think we should be doing everything we possibly can to encourage it. And I think, again, if we are thoughtful about what kind of, what kind of breakthrough technologies we might want to swing behind, my guess is that you will see a very good distribution of that beyond just the golden triangle. Um, but I would re-emphasize again the really, and just to the IP question, the really critical thing we have to get right in this country is not to be great researchers. We were already, very, as the Secretary of State said, and I said in my comments, we're excellent at that. We're not that good at translating. And I think the fixation on protecting IP has become over-dominant. It's obviously critical. You've got to have your IP. But it can accidentally create uh, undue competition, opaqueness, lack of collaboration across various institutions slows things down and becomes the reasons not to do things. To give you an exact example, GSK, as one of its subsidiaries, runs a global venture capital business. Uh, we invest in startups and spin-outs worldwide. I met with the leader of that organization this morning and asked his honest view, it happens to be a German who runs a business which is located in America, so you know, reasonably independent-minded view of Britain, I asked what his view of British startups were in the biopharmaceutical sector. His answer, very simply, excellent research, poor translation, ability to get this out of these universities. So one of the things he's done, last year he launched a program called One Start Competition in Britain, where we essentially, uh, uh, sorry, across Europe, where we essentially offered a prize for researchers who wanted to try and get their project off the ground. Very interesting what we offer them because I, th it, I think it fits exactly with where the gap is. If they won, they got a lab, a facility. They got £100,000, which shows you how inexpensive this really is to get going. They got £100,000 and they got lawyers to figure <laughs> out. And that's what, they, that's what they said they needed. And I'm very pleased to tell you that out of the competition across Europe, the two winners were both in Britain, one from Imperial and one from Manchester, which again you know, says that we've got things across the country. So, so I think there is a lot still to be done here, and I just think we need to, be, we need to just recognize that some of the things like IP, the focus on IP, can just have, if taken to extremists, unintended consequences, and I think there is opportunity for us to be a little bit more pragmatic there than we have been. Okay, thank you. Well, on, on funding, first of all, just to sort of disabuse people, um, I mean, you may have been reading in the paper, you know, we're all going to get tax breaks for being married and free school meals for lots of young children and then got the impression Father Christmas has arrived early. <laughs> well, I, I don't think that's actually true. Um, and actually, public finance is going to be severely constrained for quite a few years. And I know universities and others have been through the mill and it's actually not going to get easier. Um, I think we've been remarkably successful in many ways in you know, giving universities a new funding model which has kept them viable and protecting the science budget and last year getting the agreement, well earlier this year getting the agreement on 1516, lots more university capital and uh, support for the industrial strategy, but these things have to be fought for and they're argued for. There isn't, you know, the, the, the era when money fell from the heavens, I'm afraid, is, is gone, uh, and it, it, it is going to be tightly constrained whether you're in a local enterprise partnership or a university or wherever else. Um, I think the, the issue about um, 
less fashionable non-research universities. I, I totally endorse what Andrew said. Um, some remarkable work is being done in less fashionable places. Some of the most impressive linkages I've seen between university research and industry were, and maybe because I'd just recently been there, was Aberdeen. Um, you know, very good university, but not you know one of the top half dozen that you mentioned. And what what they're doing is a very very large number of spin outs, which go straight into the North Sea oil and gas industry. And in one poky little laboratory, they've had a remarkable breakthrough with a machine that can now drill through rock ten times as fast as the old models. Now you can see the implication of that for the North Sea and oil and gas production generally, potentially enormous breakthrough. Um, and I think more, the battle we had in this department when I first came here, there were people who said that in a tightly financially constrained world, all research funding could go, should go to research universities, period. And we took the view, no, uh, research funding should go to excellence wherever it is. And that may or may not be, and it probably is in, mostly in the traditional uni research university, but not necessarily. And I think we've got to keep that flexibility. Okay, <coughs> I'll draw to a close. <coughs> First of all, um, thank you to the Secretary of State and to his team and to the review team, not only for hosting us here, but for working on such a high quality piece of work. And thank you to Sir Andrew uh, for, I think, a deeply philosophically interesting piece of work that will live with us for a long time to come. So if you thank them both. Thank you. Welcome to everyone. Um, we're thrilled to be uh, hosting this event uh, to introduce uh, Sir Andrew Whitty's uh, rather brilliant and thoughtful report. Um, ahead of that, I've been asked uh, to just introduce the National Centre for Universities and Business because it's relatively new and um, it's just worth sharing with you what we are and how we're fitting into this post Whitty landscape. Um, we're about six months old. Uh, we're kind of focused in on things which are run like a stick of rock through the witty report, which is that the vision for the National Centre of University and Business is to increase the prosperity uh, and well-being of the UK through world-leading business and university collaboration. We thought long and hard about that um, term, prosperity, as a substitute for growth. And again, you'll see in the witty report that Sir Andrew talks about sustainable growth. And so by prosperity, we thought hard about the idea of healthy growth. Um, which is a concept I think universities are very comfortable with. Um, and that's gone down, I think, well in terms of the collaboration. In terms of the mission, and I know mission has become a very um, uh, emptied word because it's just become too associated with um, not very effective marketing. But I still think that sense of mission in an organization like ours is incredibly important. It's a kind of why are you here, what purpose do you serve, what journey are you on? Um, and the journey for us is this focus on effective collaboration. Uh, to nurture the right talent, innovation, and expertise for the UK's future growth and prosperity. Again, we, we use the word talent rather than just skills, because of course skills are only one part of what makes, makes a person whole. And universities have always had a mission to produce the rounded person, and it, it's deep in, it's in the DNA of the university system. And of course, businesses hire, promote, and develop talent, not just sets of skills. So we're focused on a rounded sense of, of how you develop people. Uh, through the university system and indeed through the school system uh, and out into, into businesses. And then finally, and I think be those of you in the room who have been doing this for a long time will be thrilled to know that we aim not to duplicate anybody. We're not here to replace, uh, we're not here to uh, substitute for, we're here to build on and integrate um, and communicate best practice. Um, uh, I keep saying to everyone, the only skin we have got in the game is to increase the quality of cooperation. Um, so we're not here to substitute anything. Although we're only six months old, we're built on the back of um, a council, the Council for Industry and Higher Education. Uh, the CIHE has been around for about 25 years, um, and it was always a leadership network of senior uh, business leaders, um, very um, unfortunately focused in on London mainly, uh, and vice chancellors across the country. Um, and, uh, but it was always effect at effective at networking those two groups together. So when uh, Tim uh, Wilson, so Tim Wilson, uh, former Vice Chancellor of Hertfordshire, actually a former board member of the CIH, he did his review of business university collaboration. He said he asked that we develop our um, structure and infrastructure to become an independent subscription-based charity uh, to become the focus for information on business university collaboration. 
Um, as Tim made that recommendation, our board accepted it, and indeed the CIHE brand no longer exists. It's, it's now entirely the National Center for University and Business. But we also said, why don't we take on a deeper role inside the system? Um, and we discussed this with our colleagues in this building. Uh, and David uh, Willits and Biz came out with the following uh, uh, sentence, which was, the center will focus on strengthening the strategic partnership between universities and businesses uh, with a view to driving economic growth and recovery. Um, we are um, funded in a very uh, witty-like way, because it's very cross-institutional. Uh, the, all the four funding councils are contributors, as are the TSB and the research councils. Uh, we're currently funded by 32 major corporates, and, we're, and that's growing rapidly. Um, and what's different from the old CIHE is we've opened up the membership to any uh, university who wishes to join. And currently that's 42 and growing. And if any universities wish to join, catch me afterwards. What are we doing? Well, um, there are five pillars of, uh, of our activity. Uh, the first one is clearly high quality analysis. And again, you find that in the report time and time again. Where's the data? How do we understand it? Um, and um, so we'll be working with, again, with the whole system to produce data that we all trust uh, and an interpretation of that data that makes sense to everybody uh, as opposed to just sing single parts of the system. Um, and one of the things we've been asked to do by the funding councils is to produce an annual state of the relationship report about the health of the partnership uh, between business and universities, which we're currently working on. Um, there is no substitute for great stories. Uh, I've spent 25 years in the media, running media businesses, um, and you can tell a great story in a two-minute film, sometimes a great deal better than you can tell in a 500-word article or indeed an 800-word document. Uh, so we are trying to develop best practice case studies that are very media rich, uh, two or three minute long, you know, YouTube generation. Uh, but the key thing off, off the back of each of them is that there has to be a payoff for a small company. If you want to be successful, these stories say, then if you collaborate with universities like this, then you can be successful. And we've got lots of businesses and universities placing these uh, success stories on our websites, um, and they will grow over time. The third element um, I find personally and intellectually the most stimulating, challenging, and difficult, which is brokerage services. Um, <laughs> in my uh, deep and distant youth, uh, about 10 years ago, I was chairman of a dating company. Um, which fortunately folded after a year, so I didn't have any embarrassment on my CV too much. Um, and I learned a great deal about how dating companies have moved from paper and phone-based systems onto online and algorithm-based systems. And it's a very interesting challenge for, for our collective system. Um, in the report, it talks about the use of online to develop these platforms. And of course, if you're trying to bring together um, tens of thousands of companies and, and tens of thousands of academics, we need to figure out how this brokerage system can work, uh, how the single point of entry in universities can be a single point of entry for businesses uh, into the overall system. Indeed, when David Willits launched the National Center, he said that there has to be a point where if you're a small company, you need um, a kind of triage moment, then you need the National Center to be part of that. Now again, that's not to replace anybody, that's not to substitute for anyone, it's to aggregate and develop uh, what people are doing already. But that's not to substitute ju for face-to-face for -face brokerage. We've just come off the back of a project called the Brighton Fuse, three and a half thousand companies in Brighton, both universities in Brighton, uh, which comes out with actually a rather brilliant set of conclusions around the fact that arts and humanities graduates are driving companies in Brighton um, uh, that are growing 10, 15, 20% per annum uh, in, because they're integrated with technology companies. So, it, it, so figuring out how you do face-to-face -face brokerage is as important as the online work, but the online work is absolutely fundamental, and it's a systems-wide uh, thing that we're working on with the research councils, the TSB, uh, the funding councils, and, and individual universities. The fourth pillar is action. Um, we don't believe in just uh, producing reports or just doing brokerage. I mean, when we come together, we can actually make a difference as a system, and we're happy at the middle of collaborating on that. And a good example of that is the London Creative and Digital Fusion Project, uh, where we are um, uh, broking a relationship between a 1,000 small creative digital companies in London and most of the universities, but also where we're working on with schools on the National Schools Engineering Prize for Girls. Um, we've got 200 schools signed up to that already. Um, in order to get more girls to do physics so that more girls can go into, more women can go into 
uh, manufacturing and engineering through university degree, uh, degree courses. So very action oriented. And then finally, another theme uh, in, in Surrender's report is, is selling the UK to the rest of the world. Um, making, making all this fantastic work uh, of, of the UK's innovation system available to other companies. We are the most open innovation system in the world. Um, we have most of the investment coming from uh, uh, boardrooms outside the UK into our system more than any other innovation system in the world. That's a testament to the strength of our system, but also there's uh, uh, an indicator of the dangers to it. If, we, if our innovation system weakens in any way, then th that money can go anywhere it wants. So we have to carry on evangelizing and telling the best stories uh, about the UK to the rest of the world. Um, although we've moved on from the old CIHE model, we are still very focused on what the membership is doing. And indeed, what we've done, this is our new web page, which launches in the next couple of days, uh, is, is figured out how to work with the membership. So um, instead of just uh, having you know, the name above the, the, the door, I, we're, what we've said to each individual business member, and this is an example of BT Group, uh, that not only do we want to see the, the corporate member, which is, uh, in this case, Gavin Patterson, um, we also want to see what their graduate recruitment program is. We want to see what they're working on in terms of innovation and development. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and it's this issue of, of trying to figure out how you get more and more transparent. So each of the universities on our council um, will um, also deliver pages like this. So these will be, if you're a small company and you want to get in and see what, say, uh, the University of Oxford is up to or Warwick University, then you'll come into these members' pages and have very clear uh, online points of entry. Um, that's uh, um, some, the core of the issue uh, for us on the innovation side. On the talent side, um, we're very focused on trying to get um, quality work experience for undergraduates across the piece. Um, we've been working very hard with colleagues on, again, on these matching services. If, if you think about it, we've willed into existence a mass higher education system of half a million students a year starting. Uh, but we don't have a mass brokerage system that gets those students into quality uh, work experience. Uh, and so we've been developing an online platform with others, again, in the system to figure out how can we kite mark the quality work experience with others um, uh, so that uh, it's, a, it's a work experience that's relevant to your education, uh, it's a work experience that's relevant to your student life, uh, and something you can carry on uh, into a job application. Um, there's a lot of uh, very, very good research coming out of universities that say that if you are um, in a, if you've got a touch point with, with the business in your first, second year as an undergraduate, you're much more likely to get a job. And we, I think systemically, we've got to try and figure that one, uh, that one out. So those are the, those are the pillars that we're working on. I think a lot of the focus will be both online and offline. Uh, and I'm still here, and Vince is five minutes late. So I. <laughs> So I've got to uh, take a strategic decision about whether to carry on talking or whether to go to Sir Andrew. I'll give it two more minutes. Any, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> no? Uh, please? <laughs> <laughs> okay. What, what else are we working on? Oh, there's a question. Um, yeah, so obviously as we develop um, lots of case studies uh, and lots of insight into how people work together, uh, we're producing uh, insight reports and short, you know, short impact reports and, and so on. So the Ideas Lab is that people can come into that and, and actually work with it, develop it. It's more, it's kind of like a wiki in some ways. You know, it's going to be a place where people who got an idea want to come and work with us on developing that idea online or indeed offline. Um, because uh, it, it feels to me that that's, uh, you know, again, if you're trying to build a, a, a network effect, the, the monopoly of wisdom doesn't sit in, in my office, it sits out in the, in the network. I often talk about um, uh, network centers or centered networks, you know, the idea that that's the, 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 that's the, the National Center for University and Business exists in this room, it doesn't exist in my office. Um, so we're looking to the, the Ideas Lab as a, as a generator of, of activity um, in that space. Any other questions? Just to say that, um, we are working uh, with uh, a whole group, a bunch of groups, including uh, the Association of Business Schools and Projects and the, and the TSB. So, so it is the core, right, the core issue of, of how do we um, bring the whole system together. It's quite often when you get launches of a center like this, it tries to become the center of activity. 
um, which I think is the wrong metaphor in a networked age. We are not the center of activity. We can be the hub of activity, but not its center. Now, I think at that point, I might have to <laughs> throw to uh, the author of the report, Sir Andrew Whitty, um, for uh, his presentation. Thank you.